natural psychology, sociology, anthropology, political science. So there are many sciences involved <clears throat> in health promotion, and that's discussed uh, briefly uh, in the introduction to this chapter too. But one of the things that uh, I note quite early, and this is based on a lot of uh, global experience, both uh, at uh, the Centers for Disease Control and also with a number of global institutions that I've, I've worked with, is that um, geography is very important in what type of science is applied. And that's one of the things that really characterizes the, the area of health promotion around the world, that it is highly variant, that um, while there are many similarities across the world, what we do find is that Canadian health promotion is a little different uh, from uh, U.S. health promotion, and that's different from Latin American health promotion, and what they mean by health promotion in the Asian continent is very different from the European continent, and uh, <clears throat> it is a wide and broad field. And not only does geography play an Im important role, but uh, also related to that, of course, is language. One of the things that's quite clear when you look at health promotion around the world is that a great amount of it that we're aware of, certainly, is uh, written almost entirely in the English language, and the English language dominates the field. This is not unusual for just health promotion. It's true in a lot of scientific fields and certainly true in a lot of public health that <clears throat> the literature and what is read and what is the research base is largely written in English. Uh, and that's quite clear. When you try to dig a little uh, deeper into local languages, of course, you run into a number of problems. First off, most of us who are in health promotion don't speak, uh, if we're lucky, if we maybe speak one other language or a couple of other languages besides um, English. Uh, but um, <clears throat> the point is that there are many languages out there. There is a large literature, for example, in health promotion in Latin America. We saw that recently in a meeting um, <clears throat> of the International Union in, um, in Brazil, that in the Portuguese language there is a lot of discussion and a lot of literature in health promotion. But its access uh, to those of us who are not fluent in Portuguese is uh, somewhat uh, limited. What is interesting, of course, is that uh, this geography also influences uh, <coughs> the theories that are used. And one can't summarize the whole world simply, but uh, there are great differences in the theoretical approaches that are used. If you look at the American approaches, you see much more emphasis of social psychology as a theoretical background to the field. If you look at Europe, you may see a stronger emphasis on political science and sociology. Um, <clears throat> but this varies greatly in every country in the world in, in how health promotion is approached. And that is discussed uh, in this chapter in a little more detail. One of the things that has happened theoretically, though, over the last 30 or 40 years in health promotion is it has evolved and it has become more encompassing of more and more theoretical bases. Although having said that, if you look at the Asian experience, you'll see that, that it's recognizably like what health education and health promotion was predominantly in the United States 30 or 40 years ago. You see that base very clearly. However, in the rest of the world, what has happened is uh, the ideas, some ideas have really entered in quite strongly into the health promotion field that probably were not there 30 or 40 years ago. And the most important may be the idea of context, and the context is very important as an idea. And that theoretical idea comes out over and over again, particularly in the English literature. And the other big C word that has occurred, of course, in the last few years is the word complexity. Um, <clears throat> and it's very common now to talk about <clears throat> any intervention or any situation in health promotion as being one that involves complexity. And along with that, of course, 
and those theoretical implications that come about as a result of context and complexity. There's been a lot of changes. There have been a lot of changes in methodological approaches, and these vary greatly across the world. I would say that uh, methodologically, there has long been a discussion in health uh, promotion about the role of of quantitative approaches versus qualitative approaches, but there also is, I believe, a coming recognition that actually all these approaches are valid. It just depends on what the health promotion question is that you're asking. And so <clears throat> hopefully we will move away from having battles about whether we should use quantitative methods or qualitative methods. That's discussed a bit in this chapter. Uh, the final thing I would say about uh, the chapter two on global health promotion is that um, social, cultural, and political forces in global health promotion science have become quite important. There is now a strong linkage between health promotion and such things as the concept of health in all policies, the concept of governance, and more recently, of course, uh, with uh, UN initiatives like the Millennium Development Goals and Sustainable Development Goals and <clears throat> many issues that involve really the idea that health promotion has to be part of the integration of the whole uh, political system. And that seems to be a, a global phenomenon. So the field has... Uh, become quite interesting, and the basic state of science in it is a, a, an extremely interesting aspect. And I'll, I'll stop there and let the next person go. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. appreciate that overview and getting us into, uh, you know, a broad look from, uh, from across the, the globe. I might have uh, missed introducing David and his uh, his his background to you all, and he's a global health consultant, adjunct professor at Emory University at the School of Public Health, but he's also an adjunct at the University of Bern. So he is uh, an editor-in-chief of Oxford, Oxford Bibliographies in Public Health. So he has, comes from, uh, I know, former uh, primary uh, lead for CDC um, at uh, uh, for global health, and uh, so he, you are really hearing from an expert who's worked around the world um, and global health promotion um, giving that great overview. So thank you very much. Um, Rick, I think we're going to go to you next um, as we'll have to see if we can get Marty uh, maybe on uh, on a three-way call because uh, we can't have not been able to uh, to her, uh, connect her yet. So I'm going to uh, move ahead and uh, 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 turn turn this over to you, Rick, as uh, talking about the future of global health promotion. Well, thanks very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, first thing I want to say is uh, uh, a, a quick thanks to Elaine and Sophie for, uh, uh, it seems like 10 years ago, but it was only uh, less than two years ago, inviting us uh, to, to work on this book uh, collaboratively and uh, uh, and to David for his contribution. Uh, and David, I think this is the closest you and I have been to actually meeting each other, so nice to meet you. And uh, and Marty when she gets on as well. So uh, now a little bit about uh, this, uh, this chapter. Um, um, John Andrus, uh, who couldn't join us today, uh, wrote, wrote the part of the chapter about a variety of issues that that he thinks needs to be uh, uh, con continued to be thought about, uh, including uh, uh, neglected tropical diseases, uh, and I I wrote a bit about uh, uh, broader uh, and in the context of what David was talking about uh, um, uh, American uh, uh, theories still tend to be fairly individual and social psychological and. And so, really encouraging folks to to be more more broad in their theories that that uh, include community, neighborhood, uh, and ultimately political, cultural, and societal reason, factors. Even though I've dialed in, I can't be heard. Hi, Marty. We can hear you now. 
You can. Okay. I'm coming Sorry. off the phone. Great. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Rick. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry, Rick. Oh, it's okay. Glad glad you're you're able to get in there. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. And I guess I guess this table is probably uh, busier than you're supposed to do in a table. Uh, so so forgive me for that. Uh, I guess I guess the academic part of me uh, showing through. Um, but uh, what what I've put together here uh, and and wrote a bit about in in this final chapter. Uh, sort of a, a summary about some of the key indicators related to health promotion and disease prevention, and uh, presented here uh, across the World Health Organization regions. Uh, we have data sometimes for sub-region, regions like Western versus Eastern Europe, uh, North, North America versus Latin America, et cetera. Uh, just want to highlight a few. Here and, and I guess I have I have highlighted in red those uh, those numbers that uh, are still considered uh, problematic or where there's there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, some of the some of the purple numbers fit into that category too, but certainly the red ones do. So, for example, infant mortality rates they, they have really reduced dramatically uh, in much of the world. Uh, including uh, Africa and Southeast Asia, but but they're still they're still considered higher than acceptable uh, in those parts of the world. So the Eastern Mediterranean, Africa, and Southeast Asia still still have the highest rates. The the chronic diseases, as as many of you probably know, uh, are really in a bit of flux uh, around the world as. As the middle classes are increasing and um, the economic well-being uh, of significant minorities of countries that we used to call developing countries that are now moving from low to to middle to to even upper middle uh, in the World Bank classifications, um, people are living longer, and uh, and ironically, as people live longer. Uh, they're living long enough to start getting diseases like heart disease, cancer, uh, have have strokes and, and diabetes. So um, the chronic diseases are increasing uh, in their in their incidence and mortality rates uh, from uh, the West to a, a broader array of countries. So you see, lung cancer incidence really is quite quite spread around. Uh, let, let me let me go back to breast cancer. Breast cancer is still largely a disease of uh, high-income countries, and you see in the Western Pacific, um, that's that's Australia, New Zealand, um, the uh, uh, the more developing uh, countries, lower and middle-income countries like like China, uh, still have lower incidence there. So North America, Western Europe are still the highest, and and Australia, New Zealand. Uh, cervical cancer um, still continues to be a, a disease of, uh, of of poorer countries, primarily, uh, where regular uh, annual Pap smears uh, are, are just not are just not feasible. Uh, lung cancer is increasingly spread as as smoking is. Uh, in parts of the world, and as smoking is reducing in in the high income countries, uh, diabetes diabetes is is increasing uh, all over the world, uh, as is high blood pressure. Uh, see the number of smokers uh, being highest in in Europe and Western Pacific, where it's especially high in China. The prevalence of obesity increasing. In, in low and middle income countries around the world. We still don't have the greatest data uh, on uh, mental health and substance use uh, outside of the high income countries, uh, but depression uh, data suggests it's, it's, it's still significantly higher in high income countries, but it's, it's expanding around the world. Alcohol uh, abuse, significant problem in, in Eastern Europe, and that, that's been true for a long time. Pollution, 
um, still largely uh, low and middle income countries where pollution is highest, and uh, including China. The percent living in extreme poverty, this is, this is really quite a, quite a stark uh, picture. Uh, still Africa and Southeast Asia that uh, have the dramatically highest proportions of people there. Uh, the literacy rate, rate for females is um, still lowest in Africa and Southeast Asia and, and followed by the Eastern Mediterranean. A couple of other contextual uh, and social determinants variables that I brought in here. The human rights risk index, uh, these are the percentage um, of countries in that region that are labeled as higher extreme risk, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Africa, uh, essentially um, much of the world, including including the low and middle income countries of the Western Pacific uh, and Western Europe and North America are, are lowest here. And corruption perception index. Uh, this is the median world rank of countries in that region. Uh, so Latin America, Eastern Europe, Africa, Southeast Asia, Eastern Mediterranean, again here, North America and Western Europe, and, <clears throat> and the high-income countries of the Western Pacific, uh, still lowest here. So while uh, significant progress has been made, um, there, there is still lots of work to be done, and, and Africa and Southeast Asia still are the parts of the world where uh, a very high proportion of, of work needs to be done. Well, thank, you, Rick. thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. That's jumping from the overview of the book at the front end, or global health promotion as a concept, to where we are at looking at the future, or maybe current status, and where we 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 would need to aim our efforts as uh, health promotion professionals to uh, to address these issues. What parts of the world? And I know there are many students out there in global health today that are looking to make a difference, uh, and in many of these countries that. Um, have uh, the worst health indicators, as you've pointed out. So thank you. And I know we'll have a chance to ask a, a few questions here of both David and, and Rick um, in a minute. And we're glad to have uh, uh, Marty Rice uh, join us. And we'll back up a little bit for an overview of the, the chapter that, if I could get it uh, <laughs> right here, <laughs> the overview of Chapter 10, uh, which uh, we talked a little bit about the non-communicable diseases, but now we'll talk here uh, particularly on uh, immunization campaigns and how that related to uh, the communicable diseases in global health. Marty Rice is a consultant, a world consultant, um, formerly with the Pan American Health Organization as well as the World Health Organization in her career. I think I've known her for some 40 years and, and all during that time. Uh, consider her one of the preeminent practitioners in global health promotion. So very glad to have you with us this afternoon as well, Marty. Take it from there. Okay, thank you so much. I'm so glad I was finally able to get heard. <laughs> We're glad um, to have you. <laughs> thanks. All right, so I'm going to give a very quick overview of Chapter 10, which is on global immunizations initiatives from the health promotion perspective. And first I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors of John Andrews, uh, Virginia Sweezy and Rick Zimmerman, who you just heard from. This particular chapter covers the history and the pros and cons of several kinds of international initiatives that promote increased child immunizations as well as child health. I think we can say, arguably, that immunization is the most cost-effective public health intervention that medical science has to offer. Perhaps only safe water and sanitation and breastfeeding may be more cost-effective. And this chapter highlights how childhood immunizations are a basic human right and should be viewed as child protection under the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. Additionally, through social marketing techniques and the well-known four Ps of product, price, place, and promotion, and now we're adding a fifth one of policy, the chapter shows how the benefits can be described in much more appealing and an attractive manner. We highlight two case studies and two initiatives in detail in this chapter. One is the Global Immunization Week that emerged in 2012 as an outgrowth of the Vaccine Week in the Americas. That initiative started in 2002 in Colombia and Venezuela with 
major polio outbreak, and by 2003, it was expanded throughout the Western Hemisphere from Canada down to Argentina um, as an annual initiative. Um, it was picked up in 2012 by um, sub subsequently other regions of the world and became worldwide by 2012. These initiatives were then expanded to Child Health Day, so it was no longer an immunization week um, or a vaccination week, but looking at a whole child, including things such as vitamin A supplementation, deworming, monitoring child growth and development, and the distribution of insect impregnated nets. I think we could say maybe the major drawback to this kind of approach is that it concentrates time and resources on just one issue. And so the people that are usually providing ongoing health services may not be available on that particular day or in that particular week. Uh, but I think these drawbacks are outweighed by some of the advantages. Um, we see a major political commitment and public acceptance of this kind of initiative, and it leads to sustainability in an ongoing way through the regular services. Um, and also by strengthening healthy municipalities and communities in healthy settings, it creates solidarity to reach a common goal for focusing all of the activities um, and the surveillance um, together in a coordinated manner. So we see that just having one week per year has a really, really high impact. The other case study uh, in the chapter is focused on the Global Polio Eradication Initiative that was started in 1988, and it created new partnerships at international, national, and local levels and across organizations and sectors. So we see like UN agencies such as WHO and UNICEF collaborating with foundations such as Gates together with national organizations such as CDC and USAID from the US, Norway, Denmark, Japan, and the UK. And, and all of these come together to work collaboratively. And we see in this chapter that we get a particularly detailed case study from the Americas and Southeast Asia, the latter being the fourth region in the world to eradicate polio in 2014. The chapter also focuses on the five-in-one prevalent vaccine where it combines childhood immunizations for diphtheria, tetanus, whooping cough, hep B, and influenza type B, um, all into one uh, vaccine. And essentially it adds hep B and HIV vaccines to the traditional uh, diphtheria, pertussis, whooping cough, tetanus combination. Uh, and the, the, the latter has been used internationally for many years. So we see that making this combined effort um, especially in lower income countries, has been able to reduce costs, uh, reduce the need for personnel and the number of visits required by children and their parents to complete their immunizations. And in, in developing countries, getting to immunization um, has been especially problematic. So being able to reduce it to just a few visits has had a major impact in terms of ensuring uh, that children are adequately vaccinated. Another thing that the chapter focuses on is on the HPV vaccine, which is a vaccine that's been developed to reduce cervical cancer in women. Uh, and, and it's been particularly challenging because unlike with infants and children, this vaccine focuses on girls, which um, you know, girls are much more independent in terms of their own decision-making than the younger ones, but also because um, cervical cancer and HPV uh, prevention is related to sex, and there's a lot of resistance to talking about sex and, and dealing with anything related to sex. So what we've learned from this initiative and, and what's been helpful in increasing the uptake of the HPV vaccine has been that when national governments make immunization, and particularly HPV, as a mandatory and routine vaccine, uh, and when it's free, then uh, it's much more accessible and it's much more utilized. Also, uptake was increased by working through schools and community outreach, uh, and also when the strategies were tailored to local norms and local needs, which is obviously a very well-known um, health education, health promotion strategy. Um, finally, the chapter focuses on family vaccination cards and child health records. Um, these are uh, paper or cardboard records that provide critical information on the child, both to the healthcare workers and it serves as a way to remind the family when they need to go back for visits. So this has been a final tool that the chapter talks about that's been very effective 
in helping with childhood immunizations and child health. At the end of the chapter, readers are challenged to identify ways that these types of public health approaches can best be applied to their own context and how policies and programs can be strengthened to provide continual support to these initiatives. So we end the chapter with really trying to get people to think about how this applies to their own context and what they would do differently or in addition to whatever they're doing uh, to apply some of these strategies. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Uh, that was a great overview of Chapter 10 and, and uh, really how the health promotion practitioner expertise and competencies are applied in, in um, improving immunization rates as well as some of the policy changes, I think. Um, we hope everybody um, will now be typing in their questions for our three um, uh, panelists this afternoon. We'd like to hear from you and any questions that you might have for them. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for those to come in to be typed in on the screen, I wanted to uh, be sure to tell you where to, you can order the book, um, whether a, as a hard paperback book or an e-book um, from Wiley.com. And I also point out that SOFI members actually get a 25% discount on the book. So we certainly hope that those of you that are SOFI members take advantage of that discount and think about integrating it into your classes or uh, your bookshelf as, uh, as you're um, thinking about your uh, own health promotion practice. Um, first question comes in here. Can you provide more information on how risk is determined based on the slide you presented? I'm assuming that might be Dr. Zimmerman. Uh, Rick? Um, let's see here. How risk is determined? Mm -hmm. Is that the question? Yes, it is. And, and if anyone else uh, uh, needs to uh, comment there, too, to jump in and, as it pertains to uh, their, their comments today. The... Uh, I'm actually trying to get to the slides here. Hang on a sec. Oh, I can uh, actually, let's put that back on the screen for folks. How about that? If you can do that, that would be great. Um, <clears throat> oh, I presume, I presume you're talking about uh, the Human Rights Risk Index. Because uh, as, as I'm looking at all of this, they're, you know, they're pretty objective measures until we get down to, to those last two. Yes. Um, that is confirmed. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I think, I think the, the organization is Malincroft. Um, and uh, they, they do a, a, very, uh, a very detailed multiple indicator uh, process annually. Uh, and uh, um, I'd be happy to share, to share the reference uh, with the group. They, they have a map and a detailed uh, book that comes out annually that, that shows all of, the, uh, all of the multiple indicators that they use. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the variables right on the tip of my tongue, uh, but, uh, but there, there are a variety of things uh, from indicators about, about how women are treated, about, uh, you know, I think the um, – uh, about uh, uh, about um, uh, 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 executions, about uh, about the rights of uh, children, etc. There, there's about, my recollection is, there's about 12 to 15 indicators that they use from various uh, indicators uh, internationally, uh, and they put those together in an index. And I'd be happy to send that reference. Very good. So. Uh, would, would if someone um, Googles the Human Rights Index, would they be able to access that in more detail? Absolutely. Too? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Absolutely. Google Human Rights Risk Index, and you'll get the Malincroft uh, 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 PDFs of their of their publications, which are which are available online. Yep. Great. Another question: Do any of the chapters? First of all, we said thank you for the presentation. It's very good. Excellent. Do any of the chapters address global injury and violence prevention? Maybe Rick, you might be the in the best. Uh, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, the uh, um, I, I I think the the short version of my answer is we could not include everything, and indeed in the intro 
in the preface, that's one of the things I say. I, I know it is a concern. Indeed, I have a, a good friend and colleague uh, back at George Mason University that for him, that's, you know, that's his passion. That's what's the most important thing for him. And indeed, indeed for, I believe for one to five year olds around the world, um, uh, injuries continue to be uh, the major cause of mortality uh, in that age group. So um, there's there's a little bit on uh, on intimate partner violence uh, in in the HIV uh, chapter, uh, but I think by and large um, um, uh, there's not a specific chapter on it. Uh, infant mortality and and the material in that chapter probably does cover it a bit uh, on uh, on infant mortality after the neonatal period, uh, but. There is not a specific chapter. I know it's it's probably one of the five or six topics. If we, if there could have been twenty five chapters that we would have added, right? But that's just the honest the honest truth. Yep, and I know those decisions are hard when you're trying to write a book and trying to figure out what what's uh, what goes in and what doesn't. So maybe for yeah. for the next uh, next edition. Um, another sure. question: um, Will I get a free copy, desk copy of the book if I plan to adopt the book for my course? Yes, you will. You will be able to. You actually can request um, that from uh, Wiley, and you can request to look at the collaterals as a faculty member if you're thinking of adopting it for your course, uh, for your classes. And I wanted to um, maybe jump off that and ask if any of the three, uh, all of you three, to comment. And um, since we do have a number of faculty here today. Um, any thoughts about uh, ways that they might be able to, uh, in particular, uh, think of exercises within, within the class? Um, don't provide a comprehensive syllabus or anything um, in, terms of, uh, uh, in terms of student um, actual uh, activities uh, or an application of the content. But any ideas that you might have on how faculty members might uh, be in, use your chapters as jumping off points for um, our particular exercises with students. So, uh, well, you know, uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, go, yeah, go ahead. I, can, uh, come in, uh, I think, for example, with the global, one of the jumping off points is quite clear that if you have a topic you're interested in, uh, take a look at it internationally and how it's treated in um, other, other countries to the extent you can. Uh, uh, if you have people, of course, who read other languages in your class, it might be interesting for them, say you have a Chinese student in your class or something like that, to ask them to look at the literature uh, relevant to the topic area that they can read. I think that's one way. I mean, I just thought of that with the injury question that was just asked. It's interesting that uh, there is a lot of work, for example, on you see globally on uh, motorcycles uh, and uh, uh, bicycles and helmet use that seems to be uh, cut across a lot of places and very active work going on in Asia and Vietnam and other places in health promotion and in Latin America where um, <coughs> motorbikes uh, and uh, bicycles are much more commonly used. So there are themes there that are really very important in the global literature. Thank you, David. Yeah, yeah that's good, good ideas. I, very good ideas. I I, uh, I wanted to mention, as again, as somebody who's familiar with with all of the chapters in the whole book and 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 the process, um, uh, especially the chapters on uh, diseases and conditions from from chapter uh, eight to chapter fifteen. Uh, there are there are case studies in every chapter. Um, and actually, actually, David's chapter provides several case studies as well. Um, uh, and uh, so, uh, uh, case studies that focus on um, uh, human rights issues, that focus on technology use, and that focus on models and uh, theories. So, so the the model theories, technology use, and um, uh, and human rights. As, as lenses, uh, there are there are boxes in all of those, um, I guess uh, nine chapters uh, on those issues, and 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 indeed those might be themes that that you have students uh, look into uh, as they relate uh, 
as they vary by country, perhaps, uh, along the lines that David suggested, particularly uh, for, for international students, uh, but, but also uh, as they relate to different, different uh, diseases or conditions. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention, Rick. And also, um, in that those are common throughout many of the chapters, you could have the students compare, well, what does human rights mean in the context of, and then whatever chapter the human rights box relates to, you know, what's the difference? How does it get interpreted differently um, within the context of the particular topic of each of those chapters? Excellent, excellent idea. Um, Marty, I know you had mentioned, uh, you talked about your, in your chapter about the HPV vaccine, and certainly yeah. in the U.S. We're, we're getting less, it's been a little bit of a slow go here, but I wondered what other countries are, uh, have more policy uh, uh, determinations by the government where and where adoption has been successful. Uh, well, I don't have that kind of detail in my chapter, but I do know that there's a, a number of countries in Latin America where I spent a lot of my work um, that have taken it up. But as, as I mentioned in my comments, the, the, one of the, the biggest challenges is not just having a policy in place, but implementing the policy. Um, and um, not just with the HPV vaccine, but just reproductive health in general and contraception and anything that relates to anything that might smack of, of sex um, has been very difficult in countries where there's a strong religious um, hand. In Latin America, it's, um, it's the church. In other parts of the world, it, it might be, you know, a different religion. But um, I think what, what's been most successful just generally without mentioning particular countries is first and foremost to have a, a policy which then creates the facility to have the vaccine available, but also to work at the local level through schools, through community groups to say, okay, this is something um, that we're trying to prevent. We're not encouraging sexual activity. We're trying to, in fact, have this um, vaccine administered before young ladies become sexually active. Um, and eventually, if you want her to get married and have a family, she will become sexually active. And so it's by no means encouraging anything, but within the context of the norms and values of those communities and those countries uh, to take all of that into consideration when introducing the vaccine. And I think that that's um, more than specific countries and policies, that's just been the approach that's been the, the, the most successful. Thank you, Marty. Mar One last question. Marty, if I, oh, go if, ahead, Chris. If I can add just a little bit, if I can add just a little bit, just because I, I did contribute to, to that part of the chapter. Um, yeah. The, uh, Interestingly, the United States has had some of the biggest pushback uh, uh, from from politics and religion, uh, and so the up, the uptake is quite a bit lower here than in other uh, high income countries. Uh, also, wanted to mention that India. Uh, India has had a big court case uh, where where they think there's a relationship between a small number of individuals who receive the vaccine and some negative outcomes uh, that, that, that really has really has slowed, slowed things down there quite a bit. Yeah. Thank you. It, it, the chapter actually does mention three countries, Argentina, Uganda, and India, uh, where they give, the chapter gives some more specific details about how this was introduced. Thank you very much. Um, just winding up here as we're at the top of the hour. Uh, there, there was a question about the kinds of resources. Again, um, there are PowerPoints for each chapter, so uh, we, we thank our student contributors to that that helped us with, the, with uh, putting those together, as well as test questions um, for each of the chapters that faculty can use to um, uh, encourage, help you through in the development of your own syllabus as, as resources uh, for the book. And of course, you can talk with Wiley about customizing uh, if you want to pull out certain chapters of the book and put together your own course pack for that. So um, just uh, winding up with uh, uh, some of the SOFI activities, uh, we are going to have uh, another webinar uh, featuring other authors of the textbook. Um, actually, that should say August 9th. I'm sorry about that. At August 9th from 2 to 3, uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll be featuring Renata Schiavo, uh, who will be talking about the M Health and E Health um, and the health communication aspects of global health promotion, as well as several of the other authors uh, of, of the other chapters. So I hope you'll plan to join us on August 9th. 
um, the 18th Annual Health Education Advocacy Summit coming up here August 15th to 17th in Washington. Uh, importance of policy, uh, backing up our, our, our education and our maybe providing us resources to be able to do um, education and dissemination uh, and addressing global health issues as well as those here in the United States. And then the 68th Annual Meeting of SOFI will be uh, next spring, March 31 to April 1st in Denver, Colorado. And I'd give you a special heads up by this sneak preview. Our call for abstracts, I think, is opening up tomorrow. So please also uh, look for that in terms of the SOFI website. Um, I want to thank everyone today for joining us this afternoon for this webinar. And I, I know you would be joining me in applause to thank all of our uh, presenters today for, um, for joining us and giving us a glimpse of this new textbook for SOFI. And on behalf of uh, the SOFI Board of Trustees, I really want to thank uh, these presenters in particular who served as authors. And I know this is so much a labor of love, uh, putting together a chapter in a book like this. And in particular, shout out to uh, our Rick Zimmerman for um, really pulling all of uh, 42 global health experts together under one cover um, to present uh, a book for SOFI. And hopefully all of you will find useful in your courses and in your reading. Um, again, for those who haven't been able to participate today, you'll be able to download the, uh, the recording in two weeks, and we hope that you will complete the, the feedback form um, after today's webinar. Uh, this concludes today's event, and um, we uh, thank you again for joining us, and please have a good day. Thanks, Elaine. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marty and David. Thank you, Rick. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.